Good morning, everyone. On behalf of uh, the French Chambers in Asia this morning, um, my name is Rebecca Sili. I'm the president of the French Chamber in Hong Kong. It is a great pleasure to be um, welcoming you all on behalf of the four chambers um, to organize this first uh, webinar series uh, to exchange on the situation uh, in Asia. So uh, this morning, um, you have four chambers representing about 3,500 3, members um, across our countries. Uh, the French Chamber of Commerce in China, uh, which is the largest in number, the French Chamber of Commerce in Korea, French Chamber of Commerce in Singapore, and uh, French Chamber of Commerce in Hong Kong. The idea behind this morning's talk was to take the opportunity of the strength of our network to give our members a snapshot of the situation in our respective countries. You will be hearing from um, the esteemed speakers this morning who are presidents and vice presidents of the chambers, and they represent four sectors which are extremely um, significant in the region, and they will take us through the respective situation in their countries. So without further ado, I would like to let our moderator, Kieran Cash, introduce our speakers this morning. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Rebecca. Yes, good morning, everyone. My name is Kieran. I'm the communications manager at the French Chamber uh, here in Hong Kong. Uh, just quickly before I do introduce our fantastic panelists this morning, I do want to remind everybody who's tuning in uh, from home or from, from work, this morning that there will be a short uh, Q&A session uh, at the end of our discussion. So please do get involved. Uh, there is a specific Q&A function if you look at the bottom of your screen while you're watching where you can ask some questions uh, and you'll be able to also vote for the questions that you most want to hear our panelists answer today. So without further ado, um, I'd like to take a moment to introduce our speakers this morning. So we have uh, representing from China, uh, Mr. Christophe Floras, he is the China Senior Vice President Operations for Accor Group. We have in Korea, Christian Marcos, uh, who is the Korea President and Executive Director of L'Oréal. Sorry, I forgot to mention for Christophe, he's also the President of the French Chamber in China. And for Mr. Christian Marcos, he is an Executive Committee Member of the French Chamber uh, in Korea. And uh, we also have Pascal Lambert in Singapore, who is the Group country head, Singapore, and head of Southeast Asia and India at Société Générale. He is the president of the French Chamber in Singapore. And of course, Pierre-Éric Saint-André. He's not sitting next to me today, but he's on site with us here at the Chamber. Uh, and he is the chairman for Dragage Hong Kong and chief executive officer uh, Asia Pacific for Bouygues Bâtiment International. So uh, welcome, welcome, gentlemen. Thank you so much for spending some time with us here this morning. Um, I wanna get started straight away. I think when we talk about the, the post COVID world and the opportunities that might lie ahead, this so-called rebound or the road to recovery, I think not just here in Asia, but I think the, the, the world's eyes are very much on China. So I'd maybe like to start our discussion this morning uh, with you, uh, Christophe Loas. Uh, first of all, good morning. Uh, thank you for being with us. Um, as we as we know, China was was perhaps the first country to really feel the the most impact uh, from the COVID nineteen outbreak. Uh, to what extent is the economy getting back on its feet today? For somebody like you who's on the ground in China, to what extent is the economy getting back on track? Thank you. Thank you, Rebecca, Kieran. Good morning, everyone. Well, like, like you said, we are kind of the first country out of the crisis per se, uh, and it makes sense because technically we were the first one into the crisis. So yes, China is into uh, an economic recovery. Um, but if you, I mean, if, if you look at Shanghai today, I mean, I was almost late for my meeting because the traffic was very intense. I mean, if you look at 
big cities like Shanghai and Nanjing, you would feel like, like almost nothing happened, except that people are wearing masks. And you do have the impression that it's, it's, it's back to, to business. But if you, if you deep dive, it's actually uh, a very con contrasted uh, landscape. So yes, the economy is back at 90%, uh, but uh, it's not a V-shaped recovery. It's more, it's a V-shaped recovery for some sectors, but for most sectors, it's, it's an L-shaped recovery or maybe sometimes a W shape re recovery. So um, uh, the way the economic recovery happens for sectors depends pretty much first on what kind of sector you're in, number one. Number two, it depends on what, what geographical area you are located. So if you are located in the, in, in, uh, the greater east or the south of China, recovery uh, goes at a much faster pace than uh, the rest of the country. If you're a big company versus a small company, of course, uh, also you recover faster. So there are multiple landscape uh, and, and, uh, and you know if you say for example that a factory is back at 100 percent productivity yes so all the staff is here the machines are working but also is there are there customers is there a demand there is a shock of demand and not every sector is recovering the same pace because also there is a lack of demand due to the uh, ongoing uh, crisis uh, still going on in the rest uh, in the rest of the world what the Chinese government is doing is to uh, promote this uh, activity and the economic recovery by pushing on a stimulus uh, uh, that is directed uh, on what they call the new infrastructures. So they invest massively in what they call the new infra infrastructures. What do they call new infrastructures is basically the 5G installation, artificial intelligence, uh, Internet of Things, um, the clean batteries, clean vehicle, autonomous vehicle, and some uh, high-tech um, sustainable projects. And uh, just to give you an example, just to, uh, on the project of um, uh, uh, chargers for car development, um, uh, the government is spending now 500 million euros. So in any case, the good news is that there is definitely an economic recovery. It's not at the same pace according to the sector, but even if your sector is not doing well, even if your pace of recovery is slow, there is a recovery for everyone. So that is the good news. Which sectors are doing bad? Obviously, you know them. So that's the airlines, that's the hotel industry, that's my industry, um, uh, art and culture. Some small retails also are suffering still today. Um, on the sectors that are doing well and picking up pace uh, on a faster manner, you would see obviously digital services, um, the re online retail, uh, but also we see that construction is coming back at full, spe uh, full speed, um, uh, extraction, mining is doing well, um, and some other part of retail, especially luxury and, and mid-scale retail, uh, are doing well today in China. So. To say that we are fully back on track uh, into a uh, full uh, economy recovery would be uh, another statement. It's not the case, um, but definitely uh, we are uh, going in the right direction here in China. Thank you, Christophe. If, if I can hand to our, our colleagues in uh, Korea, at least, at least from the outside for us, it looks like it's similar in, sense, in the sense that Korea is maybe one of these countries that's done quite well uh, coming out of this crisis, but for somebody like you who's there on the ground uh, in the country, what's the general state of affairs currently uh, in Korea? Good morning, everyone. Uh, uh, first of all, uh, I would like to say uh, that I hope that everyone is safe and healthy on this webinar. Today, I think we are just a little bit, uh, just a step uh, after what China state is. Uh, today, we can say uh, very clearly that Korea has been a role model in managing the COVID-19 crisis, uh, especially thanks to the Korean government's strong determination to tackle the outbreak, especially in a very early uh, stage and, uh, and the fast speed to try the measures. The control of COVID-19 has been uh, I will say, successfully managed with less major disruptions compared to other countries. Uh, and especially to me, what is very important is that uh, it has been avoided the feared uh, lockdown. Uh, the so-called K-quarantine has received, uh, as you all know, uh, worldwide recognition for effectively flattening the virus curve since the first case reported in Korea in January. 
So today, uh, we could say that Korea has implemented a swift and extensive testing and very detailed contact tracing with uh, well-established uh, IT uh, systems combined with uh, very stringent quarantine and treatments. Today, just uh, as an example, today Korea has the capacity or the capability to do more than 3,000 tests. Uh, they have screened more than 800,000 people uh, so far and only 11,000 positive, uh, positive uh, infections. So with a very low fertility rate of 2.4, which is one of the lowest uh, worldwide. So today we start to see that uh, life is coming back to normal. Schools are gradually open starting from uh, May 20th. Uh, most companies have resumed their activities and the normal business as well uh, so far. And what is interesting to understand now is from an economic perspective, uh, what's going on. Today, Korea, taking into account that uh, January, February and March, they were peaking in terms of, in, in, in terms of uh, infections. Korea has managed to achieve uh, plus 1.3 in GDP growth uh, versus the same quarter last year, minus 1.4 more or less versus uh, the, the previous quarter. So the Korean economy has been uh, quite impacted, especially for, I would say, uh, two factors. Uh, First, uh, the drop in private consumption, uh, since consumers are less willing to go outside for spending uh, uh, money amid the social distancing and also, also impacted by the drop uh, in inbound travelers, which is very important, especially coming from China. Uh, that was the first effect, which has a huge impact into the, into the Korean economy on the first quarter. The second one is the slow, in, the, 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 the slow in speed of exports, uh, in which uh, Korea relies uh, very strongly. Today, what is very important is uh, what is the state, what is the government doing? I think they're stepping up in efforts for the economic recovery uh, with a full package of measures. Uh, some uh, examples, for example, uh, there is a economic stimulus package, as they call, with uh, all economic, uh, Korean uh, households that can apply to receive emergency disaster funds uh, to relieve a little bit the economy. Uh, the Bank of Korea also has lowered the interest rate uh, from the previous records of 0.75 uh, last, uh, last month to a record low 0.5. So they're trying to bring this stimulus uh, to activate the consumption. And we are expecting on the coming days also to bring a third, uh, a third extra budget so that it will be announced also to try to stimulus, to give a stimulus to the job creation plan. So in this context, we start to see some, some green signs uh, on the Korean economy. Uh, the stock market index, the KOSPI, uh, start to gain confidence. So it's rebounding almost 40% since uh, the COVID-19 ruin uh, in March, which was a terrible drop. And we start to see also some signs of confidence from uh, the consumers and from the population, because we start to see that, for example, the consumer sentiment has been published uh, lately, is ramping up uh, in the month of April for the first time in the last three months, uh, when we touch uh, the bottom of the last decade. So I think that people start to feel that something is, uh, or the worst is behind. And to me, so I could say that there is a good short-term measures take, being taken in place that it will activate on the short term. But to me, it's also very interesting about Korea is that the Korea government has announced a bold push for uh, the Korean version of the so-called digital new deal that it means to overcome the coronavirus crisis and develop new growth, uh, new growth uh, engines for the future. So Korea wants to become the leading digital powerhouse in the future. And they rely on this uh, uh, startup ecosystem which it could be a driving force for the future. So I would say to summarize that uh, Korea has a short-term plan and they have a vision for what they want to go into the future. So, and they have shown in the past a strong reliability and resilience to execute plans. So I think we need to keep optimistic despite the context. And we hope uh, that S2 will be, or second semester, it will be a much better situation. Thank you, Christian. Um, if I can maybe take the approach to look at Singapore, which I think Singapore has been perhaps one of the more interesting examples in Asia of, of the, the public health standpoint and also a business standpoint. Uh, Pascal Lambert, what, what, what is the case right now in Singapore? I think we've all been watching uh, maybe a, what started as a more smooth uh, dealing of the crisis. Maybe that hasn't, hasn't quite turned out how we thought it would. What, what is the scenario right now in terms of public health standpoint and also the business standpoint? Oh, thank you, Kieran. And first, I would like to thank uh, Rebecca and the French Chamber in Hong Kong to organize this. And uh, I hope to be able to see you soon. But as you know, uh, in Singapore today, we are still uh, locked travel-wise. Uh, as you said, Kieran, uh, Singapore met, where we're currently in our, our, Singapore has faced uh, three waves of the COVID. Uh, and the th third wave was probably the most impactful, as uh, many of you must have read. 
there is a situation of these uh, migrant workers in uh, dorms, and there is a large population of them, uh, and uh, some clusters developed four or five weeks ago. And when you look at the number every day in the past uh, three weeks, we have probably between uh, 300 to 600 new cases every day. And the vast majority, 99%, are coming from these uh, clusters. Actually, yesterday, when you exclude this, there was zero case in the local uh, population in the Singaporeans and PR permanent residents. Um, so this week, we are um, actually in the first uh, phase of the exit from uh, what they call here the circuit breaker. They have their own expression for the lockdown. And uh, this first phase was initially scheduled to last for four weeks, but in, uh, with a view of the relatively good numbers that we have seen uh, on COVID, it, it may be possible that this first phase will actually last about uh, two weeks. Uh, frankly, the first phase uh, is not a major change for many of us in uh, sensitive industries like banking, uh, where and most industries are still encouraged uh, to practice uh, work from home. So as an example, in banking, from a quota of 10%, uh, we would be allowed to go to up to a maximum of 25%. Uh, but with very significant uh, constraints in terms of uh, health measure when we come to the office. So effectively, we do encourage our staff to remain uh, at home. Uh, the impact of COVID has been very significant for the Singapore economy. As you know, it is a very uh, uh, trade-oriented uh, economy. And the government expects that the GDP could go down as much as, I mean, between 4 and 7% this year, which obviously is a very significant number. The good thing, is that Singapore, of course, uh, since the independence has built up a very significant uh, war chest in terms of uh, foreign reserves and, uh, and the sovereign wealth funds. Um, and the government came last week with a fourth uh, step in, uh, in terms of uh, budget uh, support to the industry for an amount of about 22 billion uh, euros. And when you add all these uh, measures, it amounts to 95 billion sorry, 62 billion euros, 95 billion Singh dollar, which is about 19% of the GDP. So very significant measures affecting uh, job support, of course, because uh, in this uh, kind of situation, it is a small and medium-sized company which are suffering the most. So there have been some very generous uh, schemes which have been granted by the government uh, to enable uh, some of these companies to be able to survive until August or September, because it is indeed quite uh, critical. Uh, and also a lot of uh, initiative in terms of uh, upskilling the man force and also um, incentives to hire uh, Singaporean, either uh, trainees or, uh, or Singaporeans who are out of, um, out of job. The final point I wanted to make, uh, which is of course for us extremely significant, is the traveling. Uh, as I mentioned at the very beginning, we are still very much in this uh, quasi-lockdown situation. Um, and Singapore will take a very uh, careful um, uh, steps to, to ease or to reopen the country. Very problematic for activities like uh, tourism, retail, and uh, transport, air transport. Um, so Singapore, end of last week, announced that uh, they will establish some green channels with a few locations. The first one was China. Uh, ex Hong Kong, so the six countries in China have been identified uh, to have uh, to 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 to, set, to set up this uh, green channel uh, process, and uh, they expect. I mean, we hear that they are negotiating with Australia, New Zealand, uh, Korea, uh, and a few other countries. Europe is. Uh, I know that negotiations are going on, but it is still not that advanced, unfortunately for us. So it is. Um, it is clearly a difficult situation. The government doesn't want to afford to have a fourth wave of uh, COVID. So they will take extremely uh, cautious uh, measures to uh, reopen the, the country. Thank you, Pascal. Um, I'm joining you all here from Hong Kong and I'm not in the same room as Pierre Rick uh, this morning, but that's not because of social distancing, um, which is because you know, Hong Kong, the social distancing measures are, are starting, to, starting to be relaxed to some extent. Um, pierre what is the feeling amongst the business community here in Hong Kong uh, as, as the, the territory starts to sort of get back to normal in some ways and, and we look for that, that road to recovery? What's the feeling in the community? Well, thank you, Karen. Um, 
first, I think there is something here in Hong Kong, which is a bit special. Uh, Hong Kong uh, was a cluster in the South in 2003. So from the very beginning, let's say just during Chinese New Year or just before Chinese New Year, uh, we started to see some masks in the street and, and the people started to, to, to get worried and the government took, has taken some strong measures uh, just after Chinese New Year with uh, the schools uh, which uh, has closed and uh, also uh, the civil servants were asked to work from home. So a lot of people started to work from home, to wear masks, to take temperature uh, since uh, end of January. Uh, in our company in Hong Kong, Dragage, we were unfortunate because we had the first local transmission case in our company. And so we were directly involved with uh, the authorities and we have seen that, that the, the, you, all the protection measures and, and the, the people involved in the Hong Kong government were extremely efficient. Uh, the process was a really a criminal investigation uh, for each and every case to trace, to test, to isolate people was, was extremely efficient in, since the beginning of, of the crisis in Hong Kong. As a result, we are a French company based in Hong Kong. We have 2,000 people working in Hong Kong, but we have a lot of expatriate people working in our company. So we decided that the company uh, should uh, um, invite uh, the families to leave Hong Kong because we were thinking at that time that Hong Kong with its borders to China uh, uh, in operation was going to be a cluster and, and so it was safer for the family to leave Hong Kong. And, and, and so we, we had this period uh, where the family left Hong Kong and after four to six weeks, actually, uh, the situation was, was still under control in Hong Kong, but not under control in other countries and especially in Europe. So we decided that after one month and a half, that the, the, the family should come back to Hong Kong. So it was kind of funny that at, at the beginning we were thinking that Hong Kong uh, was under a lot of pressure and, and finally Hong Kong was very safe. Um, I, I would say that uh, um, the, the, the the principles uh, set up in Hong Kong for the quarantine, uh, for the uh, social distancing, for the work from home were very, very efficient. And today, um, the situation is, is uh, regarding COVID is uh, really under control. We have no cases, basically. Uh, it's only few local, uh, local uh, uh, few uh, uh, cases that we have in Hong Kong, which are people coming from overseas. Uh, only the residents of Hong Kong are authorized to come back to Hong Kong. There is a strong test and hold process. When you arrive in Hong Kong, uh, you, you, you are put in a quarantine at Asia World Expo, uh, you are tested and, and you are getting in a quarantine bond only if you are negative. If you are positive, of course, you are, you are treated in the hospital so that there is no case spread out in, a, in a Hong Kong. So the, um, uh, also, uh, regarding the economy, the Hong Kong government has set up a, a strong job support scheme with a lot of subsidies for, for the, the, the people working in Hong Kong uh, with an MPF in Hong Kong. So uh, I, I think the situation is, 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 is really um, good regarding the COVID situation. But um, we have discovered after this big health crisis all over the world that unfortunately, after the COVID, the world, believe me or not, has not changed. So uh, the situation we had before the COVID, social unrest, big tension between uh, US and China is still there, even probably more intense. Uh, so we are jumping from an health crisis uh, to a social and political crisis that we've been on before the COVID and it's coming back after the COVID. So I think in Hong Kong, the situation is most, is most worrying, is more wor worrying uh, on, the, on, on the social and, and political side than on the COVID side right now. Thank you, Pierre-Eric. Um, I do want to just remind uh, the people listening at home or at the office, uh, there is a specific uh, question and answer platform within Zoom. So I can see a couple of questions that have popped up in the chat. But if I could please ask you to, to maybe put those questions directly uh, in the Q&A platform, that will allow the other attendees to, to vote actually for the, 
the questions that they would like uh, most to hear this morning. But let's move on swiftly um, to get into some more, let's say, company-specific questions or sector-specific questions. Uh, as you said, Christian, uh, Korea has been one of the countries that has come out of this uh, crisis, so to speak, uh, a little quicker than the others. But um, how, did, how did that affect your business in terms of what sort of business disruption uh, was there for companies like yours at, at L'Oréal? Uh, thank you for the question. I think that no one could anticipate really the dimension of the COVID-19 outbreak. Uh, it has taken us a little bit with a step change. So absolutely it has significantly disrupted uh, our regular business uh, practices and routines, as well as it has posed uh, serious safety threats, uh, both to consumers on the market, but also to the employees. Personally, to me, I, I, I'm a firm believer that there is an opportunity always in any, in, in any crisis. So this unprecedented business disruption of COVID-19 is not going to be any exception. As a company, L'Oreal, uh, we got an unexpected boost factor, I would say, to upgrade our agility and our adaptability to the shifts and also to adopt new ways of working. And it has required a very strong collective uh, intelligence and reactivity as a company. For example, first, it has been a great exercise of organi organizational uh, agility to test our business continuity plans and, of course, rapidly revise our business goals and milestones and, and go to market strategies. So I think uh, to, to respond to this, cri to this crisis as quickly as possible, uh, I think uh, the most important thing is was to set the new targets uh, inside the company to navigate the crisis by managing the expectations properly, especially to the stakeholders. We were one of the first countries uh, together with China. So this, this point was really capital for us stressing the organization and to really lead the way that we were talking to, to, to the organization uh, inside the organization. Secondly, we show a uh, fast capacity to adapt uh, to the new business environment as a company uh, that no one has experienced before, or I would say that uh, we have forgot how to do it because we had the SARS also in the past, but uh, you know, we, we know that memory is short. So meaning to take a strain, uh, extreme safety measures uh, in record time, uh, we have to navigate getting sanitary supplies uh, among, amid the, the scarcity, amplifying the new policies of working from home or even uh, making uh, all our, bus our business running efficiently uh, in online. I think that also a very important factor that uh, we have been leaving is how we have renovated our responsibility side with the country. We intensify our commitment with the country through solidarity support. Uh, so we, all of us uh, in L'Oreal, we jump into Korea uh, by committing to support our local community to overcome the crisis. So we have uh, tried to help the most vulnerable populations, uh, the low-income families, also the healthcare professionals, also in, the, in our uh, cosmetic market also helping the small commerce like uh, the salons so we have tried to be close and to renovate uh, this commitment with the, with, the, with, the, with the community and last to me I would say but not uh, not uh, the less important is uh, how we were adapting to the channel shift uh, it has to be required uh, to do a quick improve in our digital strategies and capabilities to respond to the e-commerce uh, explosion. The brick and mortar the offline was clearly a uh, drop down because uh, the social distancing and suddenly the e-commerce has done in two months the same progression that in the last four years. So I think that in order to really co be committed to this new consumer shift and new ways of, uh, of behaviors, uh, it has been a strong exercise for, by the group, by the brands, to having a different new tone of voice to talk to them and really bring very rapidly new offers to be adapted to the crisis. So in our opinion, I think that uh, the COVID-19 disruption has shaped the way of working and uh, to do business. We are totally convinced that uh, this, the so-called new normal or new next that they call all the, uh, all the uh, consulting firms is going to stay here in the future. And today we are living uh, in a world that uh, transformation is going very, very fast and we have to embrace it positively. positively. As we say, after the drop uh, always comes a rebound, so we need to be ready. And what sort of impact has that had on, uh, cons uh, on consumers and their consumption in South Korea? You mentioned it briefly, that was obviously heavily impacted in the beginning. How is that changing today? Oh, certainly, the COVID-19 has changed the consumption uh, behaviors and shaped the way uh, of doing business, as I say. So, uh, Korean, to me, it, more than a complete transformation, is uh, COVID-19 is acting as a trend accelerator. I think that uh, 
everything was there, but now it has become more relevant. So to me, there is three main shifts that they are happening. First is the channel shift, as I say, uh, from, online, from offline to online. The offline business has uh, significantly decreased. Before in Korea, it was more or less 70% of the weight of the business. Right now, in, uh, in, in the space of three months, it has gone to 60%. And the reasons why is very clear. Department stores, uh, the retail has dropped uh, dramatically in Q1, uh, around minus 20%. The cosmetic brand shops that have been, have been double hit, not only by traffic, but also by the absence of uh, inbound travelers. So it has been uh, above uh, minus 40%. And the salons and uh, aesthetic clinic clinics are heavily affected due to the social distancing. So today, on the other side, we need to understand how the counterbalancing uh, force, which is the explosion of the e-commerce, it has been evolving. So it was very already dynamic, as I say, and plus 25 more or less uh, before the crisis. Now it's an accelerator of more than 35% growth and it's taking more than 40% of the business almost in every sector. So the question is, how much is going to be compensated for this online to the offline? Today it's not enough to compensate the loss, but since we are starting to come up come out from the crisis, I'm sure that uh, the marginal growth coming from the online sector is going to start to be there. And uh, second shift is uh, the cosmetic category shift. So today, uh, health has suddenly has come into the, into the playground, in, to the forefront, right? So the Korean global cosmetic market, uh, cosmetic market, for example, is estimated to be more or less in the Q1 and minus seven. And skincare is holding much better. And it's very, it's very obvious, health categories are at the stake today because wearing masks cause troubles and is making people to face cosmetic uses in a completely different way. And they try to look more for problem solving or anti-trouble skincare solutions and they pay more attention to what they apply to the skin. That's why in L'Oreal we say that I think that the health is going to be the future of beauty. And brands that they really come with uh, solving uh, solutions and they have a clear contract of trust, I think is gonna make the difference and they will be successful. On the other side, you have everything which is related to grooming. So the color, for example, makeup or hair color, people, uh, because they're using masks, they're just buying less lipsticks, it's obvious. So they're going less to the salons to make the hair. So today the question is, uh, which solutions you can bring? And it's more uh, how uh, they do it yourself uh, solutions. Uh, they do it, the home care uh, solutions. They are growing and booming. So we have to be uh, very adapt, adapt, adapt to that uh, reality. And the third big shift is, and I think this is one that is very relevant for Asia, is that uh, we are more focused now in the local consumers. Local consumers have become more relevant than ever because we were relying a lot in the global shoppers and a lot in, uh, into the inbound traveling. So I think it has been a reality check for a lot of companies that they were very depending of the Chinese inbound traveling. And today we, we start to see that uh, in Q1, inbound travelers in Korea was at minus 50, still uh, dope by uh, January. But in the last two months, it was minus 95%. So today I think that we were leaving a little bit based on this kind of uh, uh, exercise or dope session by the inbound traveler. And I think that everybody now is doing this reality check uh, to, re to look at the respective markets and really focus on what is relevant for the local consumption. And I think it's very healthy. And uh, today, uh, I'm sure that the travel retail uh, business, the duty-free business, it will come back progress progressively in second semester, but probably will not be uh, back to normal till uh, 2021. So I think it was very, very important, this reality check. Thank you, Christian. Um, going from cosmetics to construction, it's a bit of a shift, but uh, for you, Pierre-Arik, uh, obviously the, the HR initiatives, things like uh, working from home, uh, that sort of thing, so it's maybe not quite so simple in your industry. What, what sort of HR initiatives have you, have you had to put in place during, during this crisis? Well, you, you, you're right, uh, but we, we have taken a very simple uh, decision. Uh, it's just to replace the people by robots. <laughs> simple answer, right? <laughs> Actually, uh, I, I'm joking, I'm joking. We, we, we have not such robotics in the construction sector, which is a very traditional sector, and, and we have a lot of people working on sites, of course, and, and in construction, you cannot work from home. Uh, to perform the works, uh, basically. But uh, to perform the works, actually, you have a lot of people uh, working around that in, in, in function like methods, like design, architect, uh, engineers. Uh, uh, so all, all the, the pre-construction team is uh, working from the offices. They were all working from 
home. So the work from home measures was uh, one of the, 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 the most important ones. And, and it was extremely uh, useful, I, I would say, because uh, you know, we have this digital transformation plan uh, ongoing for, for many, many years now. And, uh, and I think uh, the, the COVID-19 has really boosted uh, uh, our transformation regarding digital. The people uh, and understood that uh, uh, it was possible to, to work remotely and to work together. We have implemented a lot of digital tools within the company. And I think those tools will stay after the COVID-19. So really, it will change the way we work. Um, some of the lessons learned from the work from home is uh, that the people there don't, after a few months, that don't necessarily uh, uh, like to work from home where it's private, where it's uh, not, not always very convenient for them. But uh, one thing which was really, really positive is that the people, uh, they were not traveling long distance, that were not taking one hour to go to the office, one hour to come back to home. So I think it, it will have an impact on, on the office uh, uh, building uh, as, as a general statement. Uh, I, I think uh, uh, in, in the future, we will see the cities uh, differently uh, because maybe uh, the cities today are developed with residential area, office areas, one CBD, and maybe it will be more widespread in the future where there will be more CBDs in, in cities and more mixed use between residential and offices so that you can work remotely from your company for a few days in a week, but just very close to where you live uh, through the digital tools. So it, it has been, of course, uh, um, a big jump in, in this digital world, world this, uh, this COVID-19 issue. And on the other end, of course, we have implemented a lot of business continuity plan to make sure that the health and safety of our people uh, are totally preserved. And what I can say is that with some very basic measures, uh, like wearing a mask uh, everywhere at any time, uh, temperature control, um, the hand sanitizers, the cleaning uh, reinforced in, everywhere in the company, it's, it's simple uh, gestures but it's really efficient barriers to the widespread of the disease and, and it has to be followed by everyone. The mindset was more, uh, we, we are not safe because we know that we don't have the COVID. We are safe because we act as if we have the COVID-19. And if you act as if you have the COVID-19, you stay away from the other. You wear your mask, you wash your hand uh, a lot of times during the day. So those barriers are very efficient. So I, I think we can work uh, under a virus situation. We have learned a lot uh, uh, from this, from a human resources management point of view. And you know, Hong Kong is a place where there seems to always be construction projects going on. What, what has been the impact on those ongoing projects, uh, not just here in Hong Kong, but maybe more, more broadly uh, in the Asia, Asia region right now? <laughs> Well, there's two things. The, the first one is uh, the consequences of the new uh, law, the change in laws that, that we had uh, in Hong Kong and in, 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 in various countries across the region. When the borders are closed, of course, it has an impact on the business. You, 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 you cannot travel. And, uh, and also, um, the uh, shutdown measures prevent you from working. So uh, when you cannot work, but you still have some supply chain working outside of your country, uh, you, you have deliveries issues, and you, 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 it's interesting to see how much you depend from other countries and not just one country. So one lesson learned here is about the dependence that we can have when we are producing the works and, and buying goods from various countries. If a country is under shutdown, you cannot have your goods. Or if you are under shutdown, but the deliveries are still coming in, it, 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 it's, it's very difficult. So the, the local production and the supply chain also will be, uh, I think, uh, we will have a lot of lessons learned from the COVID here, uh, from the, the, those measures taken by public authorities. And on the other end, on the, on the private market, of course, it's very simple. You know, your clients, like hotel, uh, they, they don't have clients. So there is a shortfall, a massive shortfall in revenue. So when the cash is not coming in uh, for our clients, like, like in the exhibition industry or the hotel industry or the retail industry, what they're doing, basically, they're 
immediately reducing the spending, the, the expenses, but also they are reviewing the whole bunch of projects that they want to launch to reduce the capex. And, 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 and so when there is a shortfall in, in the cash inflows, of course, you are delaying, you are postponing some projects. So across the region, we had a university postponed, uh, not, not even postponed, but terminated in, uh, in Sydney, for instance, uh, because uh, the Chinese uh, students were, uh, we, we, we come back, I think, in, a, in quite a while in, in a Sydney. And uh, in Bangkok, we had a termination of an exhibition a uh, whole uh, 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 big redevelopment of Mountain Tani area. So uh, it, it has a lot of impacts, especially in the hospitality market, in the retail uh, industry. And um, in Hong Kong, the construction sector is still pretty high, basically. It's two, three times higher than it used to be uh, 10 years ago. So there is a lot of construction still ongoing in, uh, in Hong Kong. And, and, and we are pretty happy with what, what we are doing, whether uh, on tunnels and, and uh, of course, on offices that, that we are building in, a, in Hong Kong, which is a, a pretty steady market so far. Thanks, Pierre Harik. You spoke about the hotel industry, so I think it's a good moment to maybe hand over uh, to Christophe Loras, Loras in China. Um, you know, as with, with the global travel uh, restrictions that are still in place today, uh, are you seeing that maybe the demand domestically in China will be the, the, the real growth factor um, for you at a core uh, uh, moving forward? Uh, yes, th there is no question about it. It's only the domestic market. Of course, the, the borders are closed, so nobody else is coming into China. Having said that, we are lucky to be in China because if you take actually our hotels, uh, for example, in, in our company, Accor, we have more than 400 hotels across China in, in 107 cities. Prior to the crisis, most of the customers, at least 75% of them, were actually domestic customers. Some of them uh, were uh, tourists, many of them were uh, uh, corporate businessmen and women, uh, and also uh, people coming for exhibition uh, and, uh, and conferences uh, and what we call uh, mice in, uh, in our business. So definitely right now in China, the driving factor for the recovery is the domestic market. It actually started with the, um, the tourism market because we, we got out of the lockdown in China uh, kind of the first quarter of April. And just after this, we had uh, one local holiday, which is called Qingming, so three days holiday, where, whereby usually Chinese customers um, do go out and, and go to resorts destination. Uh, so it was kind of a first test. What happened during that time is that we only uh, saw occupancy rising in those hotels, which would be uh, in secluded area, uh, in resort secluded area, and those hotels that would be driving distance from the place of residence uh, of the customer. So only those hotels where you could drive in less than two hours that would not be in a big city that would be secluded were uh, seeing a resurgence of business. But that was the first good test, first good sign. Then came a second test, which was the uh, May holidays. So that's a five days, uh, five days holidays in, in China, very popular where everybody travels. And during that period, what we saw is again an increase of travel. So all those resorts, hotel, uh, two hours driving distance that I was mentioning about were full, fully booked. But then also we saw traditional uh, resort cities like Suzhou, Hangzhou, uh, again being filled up. Uh, and also we saw a beginning of air travel. So people would again go back in planes and they would fly, especially to Sanya, which is a very popular uh, island in the south of China. And that, that second test saw again a ramp up uh, of the uh, customer demand, although we have observed a, a kind of a, a different behavior and pattern of cons uh, consuming from our uh, travelers, but nevertheless, they would come back to our hotels. Now that those holidays are gone, let's not forget that in many of our hotels, uh, actually, we, we, we don't much rely on tourism. We rely on corporate business, so businessmen and businesswomen. So that segmentation for our hotels was much, much slower to pick up pace. Uh, because first, even after the, the, the lockdown measures were lifted in China or in many places in China, still many companies would prevent their executives from traveling. 
either for safety reason, either for uh, economic reason, because their, their sector would not be doing well. And you know, when a company does not do well, the first uh, budget that it uh, basically cut is the traveling uh, budget and the hotel uh, uh, expenses budget. So we did suffer from this. Um, nevertheless, we, we do see now for the last two to three weeks, a real pickup and increase of the corporate business. Small meetings are back. Uh, conferences are back. Actually, we do also have large conferences getting organized now. Um, and I, I was mentioning to you all the um, investment where the Chinese government was pushing right now, the new technology, 5G, etc. Those uh, stimulus actually do produce uh, business travel and, and those business travelers, for example, Huawei in the 5G is traveling a lot and, and filling up again our hotels. Um, and, and today, as I speak, this morning, we, we do have hotels running at 60-70% occupancy only with corporate customers, which is something that we find uh, very comforting. Um, it's not everywhere yet. It's not in every area. Uh, and again, I, I told you because uh, of the geographical location of businesses, uh, not all parts of China were created equal. But uh, nevertheless, we, we, we keep seeing a, a ramp up and, and this is uh, quite satisfying. And, and moreover, it, it allows our hotels to flow in a hotel uh, is definitely an issue. We, we accord, we're a large company, uh, but in fact, if you look at us, it's basically 400 in China, it's 400 SMEs. Each hotel is an SME and each hotel has to uh, bring back the cash flow to uh, pay the supplier and obviously pay the staff. Um, so, so this resurgence of the corporate travel, domestic corporate travel, uh, is definitely comforting, and this is why we are happy to see the pickup of the uh, the, the uh, economy in China, the domestic economy, because this is what is going to drive the business travel across uh, our hotels and uh, our restaurants. D does that unique situation impact the way you position your hotels, maybe in terms of mid-range, higher range? Does it have an impact on how each hotel tries to position itself within the market? So no, it doesn't. Uh, a brand by definition, and I think my colleagues from any sector would, would uh, concur with me, a brand has a DNA, a personality, and then you can change that. So if you're a, an economy hotel and you're an Ibis, uh, you will remain an Ibis. If you are a, a Raffles or a Fairmont, which are our brands, and also a Sofitel, you have your own DNA, you have your own personality, and, and this is something you cannot change. On the other hand, uh, there is an impact on our bottom line. Because what's happening right now is that I told you that our customers have a different uh, pattern of behavior of consumption now, um, and that, that companies were restricted uh, with budget, uh, especially travel budget. So what's happening is, is that now um, uh, there is an impact of our bottom line because some companies choose to drop their rates, so the rate of the room would be cheaper. Some companies choose to keep their rate but to put a lot of ads on, added value in the rate. So whichever way you look at it, uh, it is going to have an impact on the bottom line. But that's a, a small price to pay uh, to kickstart the recovery, to create a, a volume buying into our hotels. Um, and what is important for us right now is to build up occupancy, volume business, and to gain, ba uh, gain back some profitability so we can uh, uh, fill up the, uh, the, the cash box. Thank you, uh, Christophe. I do want to move on swiftly because I know we're running, running low on time. And sorry to keep you waiting there, Pascal. Um, I'm interested to know, I mean, you have a, a very much a regional outlook. Uh, what has been the impact on your, on your banking activities within the region for Société Générale? Sure. <coughs> um, as you know, Société Générale in Asia is uh, following what we call a wholesale banking uh, model. So we're not a retail bank. We are not a real commercial bank, and our activities are focused on the global market activity, but also capital market and the lending to large customers. Uh, I'm happy to say that after, uh, in spite of some volatility on, on budget, so the trajectory is good, uh, but with indeed uh, some uh, difficult uh, period that we had to go through. On the market activity, uh, uh, we, we see a lot of uh, volatility and a lot of volumes on the listed markets. On the, Hong Kong Exchange, SGX, uh, Tokyo, and so on. So record volume uh, during March and April. Um, and also a lot of our corporates uh, need to hedge their activities, which lends itself to, to some of those. And one of our traditional business, which is to manufacture 
investment product that we distribute through the commercial banks uh, was very strong until April, and we saw a pretty low volume recently. But we expect that with more clarity on the uh, exit from this situation, investors are going to, uh, to be active again and have some views. On the lending activity, uh, what was very interesting was indeed to see uh, some of the large corporates in March or April trying to secure some of their uh, liquidity uh, facilities and uh, tapping some banks like ourselves. So as a result, we were indeed in a good position to demonstrate to many of our clients in Asia that we were behind them. We have to keep in mind, of course, that uh, unlike the global financial crisis of 2008, we don't speak here of a financial crisis, we speak of an economic crisis. And I'm saying this because banks usually are quite uh, liquid and uh, have also pretty strong balance sheet uh, to, to lend. <clears throat> um, the main issue for us uh, in this kind of situation is obviously the risk. And, uh, uh, as you know, banks are uh, bankers are uh, also one of our, jo our job is to manage the risk, we have trading risk, we have market risk, and we have operational risk. When you have most of your staff uh, working from home, the level of operational risk is clearly uh, increased uh, to a very significant extent, extent. We speak of cyber securities or even simple mistakes. And when uh, your team of uh, 30 people on uh, uh, clearing operations are, uh, we used to be together in the office, are all scattered at home, uh, the, the amount of risk that we are taking is quite significant. But I'm very pleased to say, and uh, as my colleagues also uh, mentioned before, that this experience has been extremely uh, positive in uh, demonstrating the capacity, to, the capacity to work from home, even in sensitive activity like uh, tra <coughs> trading or, uh, or settlement activities. Credit risk is really the one which is bothering us <coughs> uh, the most, because obviously, uh, as we are in this uh, deep recession mood in most countries, a lot of our clients are going to are suffering. Um, and uh, we, uh, you know, you, the, the level of provisioning that most banks took in the first quarter was higher than normal, but we do expect also this number to increase in second or third quarter. It is not proper to subgen. If you look at the results of the Asian banks uh, on the first quarter, the amount of uh, credit risk provisioning increased significantly. Uh, so this is really one, uh, one area that we focus on. At the same time, on the, on the positive side, and I think uh, to echo what was mentioned earlier, uh, what we have seen with COVID will accelerate uh, digital transformation for many of our clients, but also something which is very important for us, uh, Sogen as a bank, uh, the development of uh, sustainability and sustainable finance in the region. Yeah, you mentioned that digital uh, transformation. How much has that accelerated that uh, within your organization at Societe Generale? Talked about home working, that kind of thing. Is that, are those the kind of things that you think you'll, you'll carry on into the future as well? Sure. Uh, on the first point, uh, <clears throat> banks by definition are, uh, should be seen as a giant uh, fintech. And we have uh, massive uh, IT resources. Obviously, we don't have the uh, we, are not, we are not perceived to have the agility that a small fintech may have. But when you look at, again, uh, speaking of market activity, the development that we have seen in the past uh, 15 years in global markets is effectively uh, similar to developing uh, fintech activities within, uh, within the bank. And on the fintech side, we have always, and we accelerate various approach. First, we have a very active uh, incubation program within uh, domestic incubator uh, within Sogen. Um, for instance, we, uh, we promoted and, uh, uh, the emission of uh, these issuance of global bonds uh, using uh, token uh, technologies. Uh, it, is a, it is a technology which came from Sogen staff and we have put it in a separate company. Um, one activity which is extremely uh, um, sensitive today because uh, in Singapore in particular we have seen some issues on commodity trade finance is to able to develop um, to develop um, blockchain and DLT on uh, trade finance and we are also uh, actively part of this uh, so indeed we see uh, a need to accelerate on this at the same time also we look at what is happening uh, outside of Sogen and we, uh, we do some acquisition from time to time not too often and we do partner with uh, interesting technologies uh, that, we, uh, that, that we see. Uh, if you look at the loan market, 
there are some initiatives going on right now to create a kind of marketplace on uh, loan trading, and, uh, which we think will benefit to the, to, the, to, to the market, will probably participate to this. Coming back on work from home, there are clearly some questions as to uh, what will be the future for us. Singapore is a bit transport issues at places like Paris or like uh, big cities may have and where indeed you have the risk for the, for the staff. Uh, the risk is really on the transport, not really at the office. Um, but it will probably prompt us to think a bit more carefully in terms of uh, hot desking or um, issues like this. Uh, I think our staff at present is happy to stay at home because not more in terms of uh, health consideration, but also to concur with what was mentioned earlier. Obviously, after three months, people miss the, the, the team uh, the, the, the working with colleagues and uh, this kind of social aspect of working together. But I think uh, hot desking and working from home is clearly something where uh, we have accelerated our uh, understanding of, uh, of what it means. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Pascal. I am going to move on to the, to the Q&A section, section because I know that there are a number of questions that have popped up uh, throughout the discussion today. Um, we've got about five, ten minutes to answer some of those questions. Uh, the top rated question that we have uh, in the Q&A uh, this morning uh, is from Julian Harel, who asks, when do you think or believe that all the borders between, let's say, Hong Kong, Singapore, China and Korea will open or reopen rather without any quarantine to be done? So I guess an open question to the panel, perhaps perhaps our, our, our friends in China, I know obviously in, in the tourism sector, do you have any sort of visibility on when you think those borders might be able to reopen again? We don't. We, don't. we, we have hopes, but we, we, we can't tell right now because uh, the, the China is extremely cautious. The, 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 the one thing they absolutely don't want is a second wave. So they will, wait, they will wait until all the indicators that they have set uh, are onto the green to allow um, uh, the, the border opening without quarantine. I think there will be border opening uh, with Hong Kong, with Taiwan, with Korea uh, quite fast, but it will be under conditions and, and, and how those conditions will be lifted, uh, it will mostly happen as and when. Uh, it uh, required and safe. So I, I don't want to, to, up, to, to, to put up my, my crystal ball today. Do any of our other panelists have a crystal ball they'd like to, uh, to look into? Well, no, no crystal ball, but it's definitely the, the question. Everyone is, is, uh, is expecting to, to have those restrictions to be lifted. Uh, and especially the quarantine, because the borders is one thing, but the quarantine is really affecting the business. Um, so, um, but, but, but the, the, of course, the cost of the disruption of the COVID is so high that, that no state can afford to have a, a second shutdown. So, so that's why there, there, there is a lot of fear. And I think, unfortunately, the quarantine mode um, we, we will stay uh, quite a while, uh, unfortunately, because this is really the, 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 the tricky uh, part of, of the border reopening. While you're there, Pierre Eric, um, I did notice a, a more infrastructure-related question in, in the Q and A, so I'll, I'll keep you there. Um, it's a question from Ronan Hassel, who uh, asks: Do we see a will or desire of the different governments around the region uh, to launch a program of significant increase in infrastructure expenditures, as seen in Hong Kong after the SARS outbreak? Yeah, good question. Um, it, it's what, what I'm seeing in the region is, is f first, uh, these uh, public policies, the stimulus packages are um, extremely important, but they are now focused on the short term. So it's more about direct uh, injection of cash in, in the economy uh, to support the, the jobs and the employment uh, in every country. So it's very short term and, and very focused on, on the employment, what I can see uh, right now in the region. The investment in the infrastructure will probably come with new stimulus packages. Uh, and and it's, it's going to be very interesting to see the, the decisions of the various countries, whether uh, they are promoting through this uh, stimulus package environmental infrastructure to help 
uh, the, the, all the policies to reduce the carbon footprint uh, or uh, to promote the development of the 5G uh, through a large digital infrastructure to help promoting this digital transformation uh, or whether it's going to be more civil infrastructure to help the transportation, to ease the transportation or more residential uh, a building or new kind of office building. Um, there's plenty of ideas. It's going to be very interesting to see which government is choosing which sectors they want to promote. And definitely there will be uh, stimulus packages, but we don't know yet where it's going to happen. I hope it's going to be through the environment uh, um, infrastructure, uh, help or uh, digital, uh, maybe, and transportation, probably. Thank you. Yeah, I, would, uh, I would agree with this. I mean, if you look at outside of Singapore, countries like Indonesia, uh, which are clearly uh, a significant market for infrastructure, uh, the priority of the government is really, at this point of time, short term, to support through the budget the health of the state-owned enterprise. So as a result, one of our main activity, which is in project finance, currently is probably even taking a bit of a delay. Uh, because we, we, we have some difficulties to see some of the large projects uh, coming as quickly as they should. But I, I would agree also that after uh, September, October, once, we have, once this government has more clarity on the real cost to the economy, they should be able to announce some significant uh, economic package to boost this infrastructure uh, project. I did want to pick up on one of, one of the questions in the Q&A that I've noticed, because I think it, it might be the most pertinent um, for the for the panelists that we have here this morning, uh, which is posed by uh, Philippe Ricard, uh, who asks, do we have any idea of what will be the evolution of the number of expats living in major cities? Uh, do you expect French people, for example, uh, living in Hong Kong, Singapore, Korea, uh, to go back to France after this COVID period ends? Maybe from uh, maybe from you, Pascal. Yeah, it's clearly a big uh, big question here. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, uh, right now, no, uh, very very few uh, new visas are being granted. But it's part of the overall policy, and we know it will be like this. We are watching very carefully as to when they will be able to reopen this. Uh, clearly, the, the announcement last week in the new budget uh, put a strong focus on uh, local employment. I you know they expect a significant no number of unemployed people in Singapore, both at the graduate level, but also at, uh, at the more uh, senior level. Uh, so it is possible that we will continue or we will challenge uh, even more, because we have always been somehow challenged in terms of uh, employment paths uh, here by the Singapore government, something that we need to be very watchful. Uh, at the same time also, uh, for some uh, qualified jobs are also uh, mindful also that they need this, uh, these resources. So it's, uh, it, it will not open more, that's for sure. Uh, so I think it's something we have to watch with uh, quite carefully. Mm -hmm. And for you, uh, in, in, in Korea, uh, Christian, do, do you expect to see that, that the expat population in Korea, or whether that's the French expat population or uh, expat population or otherwise, do you expect to see any kind of retreat of that from, from Korea as you see it today? Um, I really don't think so. I think I agree with uh, what has been said uh, so far. I mean, uh, it's clear that, that, that issuing visas right now is not going to be something that is going to be on, on top of, of the government, of any companies, because today it's not just a question about uh, safety or about uh, be compliant with what is happening, but also about... Uh, what uh, from China has been done. At the end, uh, there is a clear uh, profit effect that is going to affect all of us. So also we know that cost of expense is going to be more expensive. So the good, the good question it will be also, is going to be the companies willing to, to bring more people, <laughs> expatriates uh, on, under this uh, current situation. Uh, to me, for example, talking about L'Oreal, I do not feel that uh, it's going to be a big move uh, of exit of expats uh, on the coming uh, on the coming months, but and neither an entry. To me, what it can happen, and this is something that we are also discussing, is it could be how this COVID nineteen uh, emotional factor is going to impact the expats. I think that this lockdown in some countries or uh, this uh, kind of confinement is going to 
question a lot of expats about uh, do I want to be outside my country or do I want to now to leave understanding that the new norm and this new reality it could come back second wave it could come back at the end of the year nobody knows so I think a lot of people is going to question themselves emotionally uh, should I stay or should I move as an expat again <laughs> I think that might be yeah. Sorry, is that Pierrick? Yeah, well, uh, I, I totally agree with Christian. Uh, I think that, that all the families are, are questioning themselves about their future, and, uh, and, and definitely there is a, 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 it's a twofold story the companies and the families. Uh, for, for the construction sector, uh, we still have some countries where we need to do more transfer of technology and, uh, and, and need uh, uh, more expat in, in some countries like uh, Myanmar, like uh, Vietnam, like uh, um, um, Sydney, Melbourne um, in, in Australia, uh, in Hong Kong even, we, we, we still need uh, uh, expatriate people. Uh, I think the, the country where we have the, the, the worst situation is in Singapore. Singapore, the shutdown in Singapore for the construction sector, and especially as the workers in the dormitories are highly infected in Singapore, I think the recovery is going to be slow, and, and, and there is a lot of questions here, and it's uh, really what Christian said. It's about the, 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 the competitiveness and the profits um, we, we, which have fallen. Uh, and then, of course, the question of the expat is at stake. And uh, in Singapore, I think it's going to be more, more difficult than other countries in the region. Sure. Um, I think that might be all that we have time for, uh, ladies and gentlemen, this morning. So thank you, everybody who tuned in at home. I want to thank you again, our panelists for this morning, uh, Christophe Loras from the French Chamber in China, Christian Marcos from the French Chamber in Korea, Pascal Lambert, of course, uh, the French Chamber in Singapore, and Pierre-Éric Saint-André for the French Chamber in Hong Kong. If I could hand, hand, hand over rather to our president here of the French Chamber in Hong Kong, Rebecca Silly, for some final words. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Um, I, I appreciate we've been a, a, bit, a bit short in time and there are actually a lot of questions. I think this is an illustration of uh, of the uh, good uh, opportunity that we have here to share uh, what is happening among four countries. So certainly to continue on this dialogue and, and hopefully to allow our members uh, an opportunity to, to exchange, we might be organizing uh, soon another session to continue the conversation. I think it's important that we stay informed and closer to the ground and use uh, the Chamber's network and the expertise of the members uh, to understand the market situation and how it might evolve. There is, uh, I believe, a shared understanding that um, the evolution will be first regional before it becomes uh, intercontinental and, and, uh, and the rebound will have to work in, in, uh, in, in the region first. And so for a lot of our members uh, doing business in multi-territories, uh, this is also critical. So please, beyond this webinar, do not hesitate to reach out to your respective chambers teams in the countries and they will connect us all together if you need information insights uh, uh, and hopefully when the travel will be allowed for all of us back welcome uh, you in the respective chambers in in the different countries and we will be in touch to organize a next joint webinar very shortly i think the beauty of this is also for the chambers we had a, a, a massive digital transformation ourselves we had to learn to become uh, events organizers online uh, as opposed to physical uh, events, but actually we've seen the benefit. This has allowed us to have more than 200 participants uh, online this morning, which is uh, fantastic. And, and a lot of questions we will have to answer another time, but we will keep these questions and reach out to the members separately. Thanks everyone and uh, stay safe and stay well. Thank you.